Professor Richards was absorbed in thought when Freya knocked on the door of his office. With an enormous effort, he wrenched his mind away from the equations and diagrams drawn on six sheets of A4 paper carefully laid out on his desk. Come in, he said. Her face was expressionless. Her red hair was tied into a knot at the back of her head and she wore a grey-blue jacket and a floral skirt. Casual, but never scruffy, Richards noted approvingly. If only he could say the same of all of his graduate students. What can I do for you, Freya? he said. It was you, said Freya. I beg your pardon, said Richards. She reached inside her jacket and pulled out a small black handgun. I bought this from a drug dealer to kill you with. She said. A year earlier, Freya had attended her very last counselling session. It was autumn and the wind was whistling through the trees outside as she sat in a brown leather chair in the counsellor's office. It's always the same nightmare, she said. A man comes in. He has no face. There's only skin where his face should be. He seems to know my father. They argue, and he shoots my father. He grabs me. I think he's going to kill me, but he takes me downstairs and leaves me there. If only I could see his face. Let's try an exercise, said the counsellor. She glared at him warily out of the corners of her eyes. She held her head in her hand, elbow propped on the side of the armchair. One good thing you could say about Sam. He had comfortable chairs. Okay, said Freya. Close your eyes, she obeyed. I want you to imagine that the man who killed your father is sitting in front of you. Her pulse quickened. We've already tried this exercise, she said. That was five years ago, said Sam. You've come a long way since then. Okay then, said Freya reluctantly after a pause. Sam had his fingertips pressed together and he was staring into space. Imagine he's sitting right here, next to me. What would you like to say to him? I'd like to tell him to pray, said Freya. Pray, said Sam. That's interesting. Why? Because I'm about to cut his jugular open with that letter opener on your desk, said Freya. Sam sighed. You know that wouldn't help you, he said. I think it would, said Freya. Freya... Life isn't fair. Bad things happen to good people, said Sam. Part of learning to be complete adults is that we have to learn to accept that. How many times have we talked about this? And where's the justice, said Freya. Where is the justice if a man can kill a father in front of his daughter and get away with it? In life, there isn't always justice, said Sam. Buddhists, for example, believe Freya uttered an expletive. Well, perhaps it's best if we wind it up for today, said Sam. This time Freya didn't bother making another appointment on her way out. Five years of being told the same thing over and over again. Enough was enough. At home she lay on her bed and looked at internet forums on her phone. She always read the same forums. The ones where victims of crime posted their stories. She knew some of her stories off by heart. She had read them so many times that she had inadvertently memorised them. This time, a new story caught her eye. I was walking down the street late at night with my pal Steve. That's not his real name. Where we were walking, there weren't many street lights, but we weren't scared. We both thought we were pretty tough. His car suddenly stopped and three guys got out. One of them had a gun. They were wearing balaclavas so we couldn't see their faces. They told us to hand over our wallets. We had no choice, we gave them our wallets. Then the guys got back in the car, but as they were driving off, one of them shot randomly in our direction. I don't think they even meant to hit us. They were laughing like they were all high. They didn't care. The bullet hit Steve in the heart. He died instantly. When I talked to the cops, I couldn't remember anything. I was in shock or something. I couldn't even remember what kind of car they were driving. The cops said it was unlikely they'd catch them. That's when an acquaintance told me about amethystine. It's some kind of drug that lets you recall old memories. 
My acquaintance knew a guy who knew a guy. He got me half a gram. He said, it's unpredictable and you have to really concentrate on what you want to remember. I took it and it worked. I saw the car. I saw the license plate. I told the police I'd remembered some new stuff. They caught the guys. Now they're locked up where they should be. The shooter got the death penalty. Freya put her phone down and stared at the ceiling. Amethystine. If it worked for things that happened days ago, could it work for things that happened years ago? But where to get this drug? Was it even real? There was a man who always stood on the corner by her flat, apparently engaged in a long conversation on his phone. She was 90% sure he was a drug dealer. What else could he be? The following day, instead of hurrying past him as usual, she stopped. He slowly put his phone down and slid it into the pocket of his leather jacket. What do you want? He said. A drug, she said. It's called amethystine. He regarded her steadily through his tinted lenses. I don't have any drugs, he said. Please, she said, I need it. I don't know how to get it. I'll pay whatever you want. He looked her up and down slowly. She was pale and had dark circles under her eyes. She looked exhausted and miserable. You should see a doctor, he said. Have you seen yourself? I've been to a doctor, she said. I've been to lots of doctors. I don't have any, get lost. He took his phone out of his pocket and started typing something. Please, she said. He swore at her. She walked away. She didn't know of any other drug dealers. That night, she searched the internet for amethystine. She found a lot of stuff about amethyst and nothing about the drug, if it even existed. Later, she fell into a sick sleep that lasted only three hours before she awoke again with angry and obsessive thoughts swirling in her mind. The next day she passed the man again as she was walking home from work. Work hadn't gone well. She worked part-time as a receptionist, and even large amounts of makeup was proving less and less successful at hiding her inner turmoil. Her boss was starting to take an unwelcome interest in the state of her health. She began to speed up when she saw the dealer, but as she passed him, he shouted to her. Hey. She stopped. What, she said. Give me fifty, he said. Fifty pounds, she said. No, fifty kilos of fish, what do you think, he said sarcastically. Do you have it, she said. No, but I know someone who does. I'll put you in touch, but I want fifty for the service. Why, she said. I'm taking a risk, he said. Do you want it or don't you? Okay, I want it, she said. She fumbled in her purse and took out fifty pounds. It was all she had with her, and it was pure luck that she had it. The sea lion, he said, as she handed over the money. Thursday, 7pm, ask for Goran. Tell him Pete sent you, take money. A lot of money. She knew the place he meant. It was a seedy pub in the worst part of town. On Thursday, she dressed in her worst clothes and made her way to the sea lion. The pub was full of tough, angry-looking men. There were no women in there. The men turned to look at her when she walked in. I'm looking for Goran, she said, to the man behind the bar. He nodded to the corner. There was a man sitting there alone, smoking, reading something on his phone. Apparently the smoking ban didn't apply to this particular establishment. She walked over to him. Are you Goran? she said. The man didn't look up. Who are you? Pete sent me, she said. Sit down, he said. He was bald, perhaps sixty years old with a deeply lined face. There was an ugly scar on his neck. He spoke with a foreign accent that she couldn't quite place. She sat down opposite him. He settled a pair of cold grey eyes on her. I'll sell you five grams for five hundred. I've only got four hundred, she said. It's all I've got. Two grams for four hundred, he said. She was about to argue, but she thought better of it. Okay, she said, passing him the money. Here. He slid a small bag along the table. 
As she reached for it, he grabbed her wrist. Why do you want it? He said. A man killed my father when I was three years old, she said. I want to remember his face. What will you do if you find this man? He said. I'll kill him, she replied. For a moment he stared at her, expressionless. Then he laughed. And your mother? He said. She approves of this? She died giving birth to me, said Freya. My father was all I had. Goran's face showed no sign of any emotion, neither surprise nor sympathy. Suddenly he let go of her wrist. If you remember this man, bring me more money, he said slowly. Now go. What do I do with it? She said, standing up. Half a gram under your tongue, said Goran. Any more and you die. Weigh it. The following day she purchased an electronic balance from a head shop. In the evening, she divided the two grams carefully into four doses, half a gram each. The drug came in the form of a purple iridescent powder. It looked almost like ground amethyst. She lit a candle for light, thinking subdued light might work better. Then she sprinkled half a gram underneath her tongue, lay down on the bed and waited. It tasted disgustingly bitter and burned slightly. There was something else too, a foul, rancid taste, like a cross between burnt plastic and rotten meat. She tried to focus on her childhood, on the earliest memories she had, and on the vague, almost dreamlike memory of her father's murder. For the first 40 minutes she felt nothing other than a slight tingling in her fingers and toes. Frustrated, she opened her eyes. And she saw it, somehow behind her eyes, as if a dream. She was in the living room of the house she had lived in with her father. Her father was sitting in a chair watching TV. He was saying something to her. In her hand was a toy rabbit. The air smelled of the food they'd just eaten. She felt happy, contented. The dream vision was so clear that it supplanted what her eyes could actually see in reality. For a few moments, reality seemed less important than what she saw in her mind's eye. It was as if she was actually there. Then, just as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone. For the next half an hour, other visions flickered in her mind, but none so clear as the first. She cursed herself for not having taken more money to the sea lion, but the only way she could have taken more money would have been if she'd borrowed money from somewhere. How was she going to be able to hit upon the right memory with only three doses left? She spent most of the weekend trying to find out more about the drug. After hours of searching the internet, she came across one other account. It was from a man who said he'd turned into an octopus after taking the drug and had lived for three years as an octopus before waking up. He said he hadn't been the same since and couldn't function properly anymore. He said this had happened on his fifth dose. The drug had a kind of sensitizing effect, the opposite to tolerance, and it became weirder and stronger the more often you took it. She went back to reread the original account she'd found and discovered it had been deleted. She decided to try asking the drug dealer if he knew anything more about amethystine. But when she went to check the spot where he usually stood, he wasn't there. He wasn't there the whole of the next week either. In fact, she was never to see him again. After a week, she decided to take a second dose of the drug and hope for the best. After placing the powder under her tongue, again she started to feel the tingling in her fingers and toes. This time it extended into her hands like a mild case of pins and needles. Again she closed her eyes. After 40 minutes, she opened them, and then the vision came. She was riding a tiny child's tricycle, her father walking behind her, watching her. She was happy. The bicycle hit a stone and she almost fell off, but her father grabbed her and lifted her into the air. She laughed. She blinked, and the dream vision vanished. 
For a few seconds, it had been as though she had actually been there. She had felt what she had originally felt when she was riding that tricycle. The memory had been there in her brain somewhere, but lost and forgotten. She closed her eyes and suddenly she was a child again for the second time that day. She was younger this time. She was in her father's arms. Her father was talking to another man. She turned to look and she saw the other man's face clearly. She didn't understand much of what he was saying. He was shaking his head and her father was trying to persuade him of something. When she emerged from the vision, she suddenly understood what her father and the man had been talking about. She could reconstruct the conversation in her mind. The Black Death killed a lot of people, but it disproportionately killed the peasants, her father said. Don't you see? That's why England entered a golden age of prosperity and innovation. Those people were dragging the others down. Maybe you're right, maybe you're not, said the other man. That doesn't mean it's right to kill people. You're off your rocker, Tristan. I'm talking about people who are mostly nothing but a misery to themselves and others, said her father. All I'm saying is, think about it. Think of the life we could have, your children could have, with the least able people simply gone. It's monstrous, said the other man, and I'm sick of talking about it. You don't talk about anything else these days. The other man's face was familiar somehow. She tried to rack her mind, imagining what he would look like when he was older, or perhaps with a beard, and then suddenly she knew who the other man was. It was Professor Richards. It made sense. Richards had known her father. On Monday, she waited till Richards was finishing his lunch in the common room in the University Bioscience Department before raising the subject. She told him what she remembered. Richards was vague and hesitant. I don't remember that specific conversation, he said. But we used to talk about that sort of thing a lot. You have to understand, I've written extensively against eugenics, and your father was a provocateur. If there was something he wasn't supposed to say, he'd say it. In a way, that was part of what made him brilliant. But you couldn't have been more than two years old if even that. How could you possibly have remembered all this? With the help of a drug, said Freya. It's called amethystine. I suppose because it looks like amethyst. It makes you remember things. I've heard of it, said Richards. It's dangerous, very dangerous. Freya, you can't be messing about with that stuff. You have a great career ahead of you. Your mind is precious. You can't take silly risks with it. I'm careful with the dose, said Freya. I only have two more doses left anyway. Throw them away, said Richards. I'm serious. I heard of a boy who took this drug and he never came back. He thinks he's a mug, literally a mug, because that's what he happened to be looking at when the drug started working. He's stuck like that permanently now. You mustn't take this drug again. Promise me you won't. Freya shifted uneasily in her seat. She had the distinct feeling that Richards was hiding something. Professor, do you know who killed my father? Professor Richards seemed to freeze. No, of course not, he said. If I knew, I would have told the police. Look, I don't know what you hope to find out by taking this drug, but believe me, it won't do you any good. Your father is long gone, Freya. You have to accept that. Our work here, now, is what's important. I need you to be focused on that. I am focused on it, said Freya. Promise me you'll destroy the remaining doses, said Richards. Outside there was a high wind. The trees in the courtyard swayed and bent, and the window frame rattled every time a fresh gust hit it. On the way home she passed the spot where the drug dealer had stood. He seemed to have vanished. She hadn't seen him since he had told her about Goran. Suddenly she came to a decision. When she arrived home she took out the box where she kept her late grandmother's jewellery an engagement ring, a wedding ring, and a pair of earrings. She took them to a pawnbroker who gave her £700 for them. 
Then she made her way to the sea lion. Goran was only too happy to supply her with a handgun and a cartridge containing bullets. When she asked him how to use it, he told her to look it up on the internet. You remember who you want to kill then, said Goran, as she rose to her feet. No, she said, but I will. I got close. It's only a matter of time. That night she lit a candle and placed the two remaining doses of the drug in front of her. Then she abruptly burst into tears. The memories the drug had brought back were bittersweet. For a short time she had remembered the deep love she had felt for her father. She had felt it again, but now she had to deal with the present, where a madman had murdered him and had never been brought to trial. She took one of the doses and placed it under her tongue. Then she lay back and closed her eyes. Suddenly she opened them again. She felt confused. Where was she? Then she remembered she was planning to take the drug and to try to remember more about her father. She went to her desk and picked up the little packet into which she had placed the fourth and final dose. She noticed her mouth felt weird. She must have eaten a mint or something, but she couldn't remember it. She placed the fourth dose under her tongue, then she lit a candle. She watched the flame for a few moments, feeling a sense of peace wash over her. Then she went to lie down on the bed. Her hands and feet felt weird, as if she had scalded them in hot water. Where was she? Again the confusion. She closed her eyes. She was in a warm, red, enclosed space. She could see only red light. She could hear a rhythmic beating and gurgling sounds. She tried to move, but her movement seemed to be restricted. Then suddenly she was soaring hundreds of meters above the ground. She was a bird. She had always been a bird. She always would be a bird. Being a bird felt completely normal. She was in a flock with hundreds of other birds. Together they descended to the ground and she looked for worms and insects to eat. She found a small worm and swallowed it eagerly. For two years she lived as a bird. Life was hard but good. She raised two broods of nestlings. Magpies were a constant worry. They always tried to eat her eggs, but she managed to fend them off. The third winter was hard. She felt cold and weak. She couldn't find food. The last thing she saw was a fox. And then she was human again. She lived with her father. He was kind and wise, but often he was absorbed in thought. One day a man came to visit her father. She knew the man. He was nice. Today he seemed worried, agitated. The man and her father began to argue in front of her. Her father told her to go to the other room, but she ignored him. She was playing with a doll and didn't want to be alone. Then the argument seemed to reach a crescendo. She looked up and her father had a gun. He was pointing it at the man. She shouted to her father and for a moment he looked in her direction. Then the man suddenly lunged at her father and grabbed the gun. The two men struggled with each other. Then there was a loud bang and her father dropped to the floor. Her heart beat fast in her chest. The man grabbed her, he was saying, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, and crying. He put her down in the living room and told her to stay where she was. He said the police would be coming soon. Then he left. Before the police could arrive, she somehow skipped forwards in time and found she was living with her adoptive family. She was crying. She missed her father. Her new mother was trying to console her. Eventually it was time to sleep. Her mother read a story to her and she closed her eyes. As she fell asleep, she had a feeling that something was wrong. She should not be where she was. She should be somewhere else. A distant memory came to her, a memory of another life. What other life? Where should she be? She had a feeling of fighting her way up through vast oceans of time and space, rising, always rising, floating up to a distant light, 
at first impossibly dim, but then brighter and brighter. When she opened her eyes, a doctor was leaning over her. Freya, she said, can you hear me? She nodded. Can you tell me your full name? Freya Stanton, she said. The doctor smiled. It's good to have you back with us, Freya, she said. You've been in a coma for three weeks. What happened, she said. Tomorrow, said the doctor. For now, you must relax. The nurse will bring some food a little later. Later that day, she was able to finish a bowl of soup with the help of a nurse. The next day, the doctor returned. Your candle set fire to a curtain, she said. It set off the smoke alarm. That's why we found you. Don't worry, there wasn't much damage. Just a burned curtain. You were very lucky. Your neighbours called the fire brigade, and when they broke the door down, they found you. You were unconscious on the bed. We know you took some sort of drug or poison, but we couldn't identify it. Were you trying to kill yourself, Freya? She tried to remember. Was she trying to kill herself? No, she said finally. The doctor smiled. Good, she said. We'll keep you in for a few more days for observation. We have a psychologist here. We'd like you to talk to him. It's not Sam, is it? She said. Yes, said the doctor. Do you know him? Too well, said Freya. I think I'll pass. Well, your parents will be here soon, said the doctor. They're very worried. They've practically lived here for the past three weeks. They'll be very happy to find you awake. The following week, she was in Professor Richard's office. She put the gun down on his desk. I saw everything, she said. I remember everything. Richard sat back in his chair, an agonised expression on his face. Suddenly he sighed heavily. I'm sorry, Freya. We were struggling over a gun. It wasn't mine. The gun went off. I know, said Freya. I know. Your father was a psychopath. He had developed a virus that would have wiped out a third of the world's population. Anyone who possessed certain genes associated with low IQ would have died. I thought it was just talk. Then one day he showed me his work. He explained it all to me, his twisted hobby. He was about to release the virus. He knew I would try to stop him. He had a gun. All these years I've tried to keep it from you. I don't understand why the police never realised it was you, said Freya. Oh, but they did, said Richards. MI5 got involved. The whole thing was hushed up. Imagine the panic if people had realised how close we came to a second black death. You should have told me, said Freya. Would you have believed me, said Richards. Would you have understood? Freya sighed. Maybe not, she said. Richards nodded at the gun. You're not here to kill me? No, said Freya. If you like, I can throw it in the river later, said Richards. Thank you, said Freya. As she walked home, a feeling washed over her, a feeling she'd felt only once before, when she had thought she was a bird. She looked up at a flock of starlings skittering through the sky, and she smiled. Thank you for listening. My name's John and you've been listening to Science Horror. If you like this story, please give the video a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already subscribed. That helps me with the YouTube algorithm enormously. Next week I'm going to read a story I've written about a man who's possessed by demons. Or is he? Join me again next Monday for that. And until next time, sleep well.